we begin with a look at this idea in the Bible, which I am calling Stones and Bones and Desert Zones. <laughs> and you'll see why, but if you don't already know. But the question is, do you think that all is lost? That's the question. Do you think all is lost? I'm afraid that uh, you might be tempted to think that based on any of a number of things in life. There are setbacks, there is bad health, there is uh, changes in environment and economy, etc., etc. So many things that can go wrong, most of which will, <laughs> at least from my way of looking at it anyway. But um, one thing is sure that God is unchanging and that God is blessing us and that he is able his purpose will go forward. So I wanted to look at these things together. Let's start with stones. Uh, I think we're going to start with stones. Go. There we go. Which is over in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 3, where John the baptizer says, God is able to raise children to Abraham from these stones right here. The rocks around them wherever they were so this is something to keep in mind um, when it comes to where are they going to come from in Luke 3 we have this record of John starting at verse 7 he said the crowds that came out to be baptized by him meaning they came in order to comply with his teaching and when they showed up he called them brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come bear fruits in keeping with repentance and don't begin to say to yourselves we have abraham as our father i tell you god is able from these stones to raise up children for abraham even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So I understand that he's telling them not to rely on their family, their heritage, their nation, uh, lineage. Uh, literally, that is true because they were Israelites and until this time, they certainly had done so. See Romans the letter from Paul to the Romans <laughs> on this topic. Okay, but today the spiritual children of God, or all of the God's children are spiritual children, born of spirit, not of flesh. So when he says to them, we have, uh, don't begin to think, you know, we have Abraham as our father. From these rocks right here, God is able to raise children for Abraham. What I'm pulling from this is not about Jew and Gentile. What I'm pulling from this is that you don't have to worry about where are Christians going to come from? Who is going to obey the gospel? Um, you know, will there be a church? You don't have to worry about that. God is the one who brings forth the fruit. We labor in the vineyard. We're vine dressers. You know, we're workers in the kingdom, but God is the one who brings the increase. And he's not limited by circumstances the way you and I are limited by circumstances, just like this one. They don't have to rely on the nation to perpetuate itself. God can raise children for Abraham, even from rocks of the ground, which you would say is not possible, perhaps, but you would be wrong. God can do whatever he wants to do. There's nothing impossible for God. So we have to trust that it's in his hands. He will take care of this. You don't have to worry about where is it going to come from or how are we going to make it possible for us because it's not our work. It's not for us to, to do. God is the one who does it. You teach the truth. You stand for what is right in your life and God will bring the increase. I'm not saying you don't try to help others who are around you to come to know the gospel, by no means. 
I'm not saying you don't want to study the Bible with people that you know and love. I, I'm not saying that at all. Don't even begin to think <laughs> that I've said something like that. <laughs> I've never said that. Um, what I'm saying is, even when you do study, even when you do teach, the effectiveness of it is not your own, it's God's. If you say something that is effective or useful or helpful, or if I do, in this pulpit or otherwise, it's only because it accurately represents what God says in the Bible. This is why I reject commentaries for the most part. People give me commentary passages. I don't want them. Uh, you can use one if you want to, but if it says anything that is useful, anything that is helpful, anything that is good, what it says is something that the Bible contains that maybe you hadn't noticed before. That's fine. But don't come to me with a commentary. Give me the thing in the Bible that you hadn't seen before. Give the Bible verses, and if there aren't Bible verses for it, then why are you listening to it? Whoever he is or she is that wrote this thing, I don't care. What does the Bible say? God is the one who raises these children. All right, so that's just to say, first of all, you don't have to worry about where they're going to come from. It doesn't have to be obvious to us where they're going to come from. Nobody saw me obeying the gospel, I'll tell you that. <laughs> there was no warning. Well, Tom Roberts said he had some misgivings <laughs> about whether he should about whether he should stay there you know, not knowing anything about me or where I'd come from or why I'd come forward. I can understand that. So you never know. And you don't need to, thankfully. God has made it such that that's his to do. Ours is to live right. So that's stones. And now it's bones. Ezekiel 37. But in Ezekiel 37, where Ezekiel cried, them dry bones. <laughs> the bottom line is that God said, I have spoken. I will do it. God is trustworthy. What seems impossible for us is not out of reach for God. Ezekiel 37 just Go, let's just go through this and understand together. In the first verse, the hand of the Lord was upon me, says the prophet, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. He led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. Well, the meaning of this is there was a battle here, a great battle, and many, many soldiers have lost their lives. And it was a long time ago. They're dry. There's not, this is not a fresh battlefield with rotting corpses and birds having a feast. This is an old battlefield he has stumbled upon, and they've been gone for a long time. He said, Son of man, can these bones live? <laughs> and I answered, O Lord God, you know. Good answer, Ezekiel. A lot of people would say, no. Don't be ridiculous, God. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, right. He said, nope, uh, you know, Lord. You know, it seems to me that they can't, but I'm not going to tell you. That's the right attitude. So the fourth verse, he said, prophesy over these bones. Say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you. You will live. I will lay sinews upon you, cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath into you and you will live. And you will know that I am the Lord. The prophecy means speak on my behalf. So now Ezekiel speaks to the bones saying what God told him. Hear the word of the Lord. <laughs> 
breath will enter you, that is, spirit, you will live. Sinews, flesh, skin, and breath. So, Ezekiel 37, verse 7, I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was doing so, there was a sound. Behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh, and skin, but there was no breath in them. So we've gone from a valley of scattered dry bones to bones have come back together. Sinews and flesh have covered them. Now we have soldiers lying all over the field. And he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, say to the breath, thus says the Lord God. Come from the four winds, O breath. Breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. <laughs> so one prophecy gives them a body, the second animates them with the spirit, and they are an exceedingly great army in a valley where there was nothing but dirt and bones, there is a great standing army. And he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, we are indeed cut off. So prophesy and tell them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, my people. I will bring you into the land of Israel. You will know I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from them, my people, and I will put my spirit within you, and you will live. That is my breath within you. You will live. I will place you in your own land, and then you will know I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it. So he starts with the valley of the dry bones with something that seems to us impossible, bringing them to life with one, or bringing the, the, you know, the body, the receptacle in one prophecy, but the second overtakes the first, and that's the one that brings the spirit into that body, giving it life, turning it into a standing army. And that standing army, he said, is, you know, these are the bones of the children of Israel. Uh, the whole house of Israel, verse 11. Who at this time were saying, our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, we are indeed cut off. See, they thought all was lost. They thought, oh, there's no way this is going to turn out. Well, because they're looking around instead of looking up. <laughs> That's the bottom line on that one. You're looking around you to the left and to the right. And yeah, if you look to the arm of flesh, well, the arm of flesh will fail you. True. You're looking at human means and human ways of accomplishing things. Well, no, we generally don't have those powers. But they were not thinking about God. And they're thinking, yeah, bones are dried up. Hope is lost. We are cut off. I mean, we're, we're going to cease to exist. No, that's not true. God can raise children to Abraham from these rocks or a standing army from these dry bones. But they were despairing. And this, you know, this thing that is recorded for us is telling us that that's not how it's going to be. God says, I'm going to open your graves and raise you from them. There is this idea of resurrection from of old, but you know, you tend to think of death as the final thing. <laughs> um, and, you know, for, for reasons that are good reasons, but God does have resurrection. And as bad and as final as death is, God can still beat that too. He can overcome that. And when the Spirit of God is within us, through his word, which indwells us, of course, 
and you are living the life of God and making the choices of God, you will come to realize that you are alive again and that God has made a place for you. And you will come to see that God is the one who has spoken and God is the one who has done it. That's just true. We do God's things and God's ways, we'll get God's results. What seems impossible with men is possible with God. Well, there's stones and there's bones and now we have desert zones in Isaiah 43. <laughs> there are rivers in the desert, according to the Holy Spirit in Isaiah 43. He says, thus says the Lord who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, fear not, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You belong to me. That's the first thing. Though we might be on the market as human chattel, slaves or servants, whatever it might be, the one who has paid for us is God. He has called us by name. We have become his possession. Then you skip down to the fifth verse. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west I will gather you. Say to the north I will give up and to the south do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar, my daughters from the end of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. You see again, East, west, north, south. We read in the dry bones incident of Ezekiel that the four winds of the earth breathe that breath into them to give life. Here he calls them from the four corners of the earth back to this land. Everyone called by his name whom he created for his own glory, whom he formed and whom he made. Let us not forget that God is the one that gives birth to faith and his children are born according to faith, not according to the flesh. Just because your parents are Christians doesn't mean that you are a Christian or that, uh, that you are right with God or, or, and vice versa. It isn't like human affairs where we have these human dynasties, this human heritage, we inherit characteristics from one another. It's not like that. God does not have any grandchildren. Every person obeys the gospel for themselves. And that is a special creation for God's glory. That is a person, a spirit, if you will, formed and made by God in his image for his purpose. So we go down to 18 of Isaiah 43. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old, Behold, I do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Don't you perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Yeah. Stop looking back. <laughs> One grandma is purported to have said, glance in the rearview mirror. Don't stare. <laughs> That's a good point for drivers and everyone else. <laughs> I had a friend who told me Lubbock looked really good in his rear view mirror. <laughs> no offense to any Lubbockians. Just, I remember him saying that and stuck, stuck with me for some reason. But no, he said, don't remember the former things. Don't consider the things of old. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. And God is always doing something that is new. It is new life that is starting in Christ Jesus. It's springing forth even now. Don't you perceive it? A road in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. So a road cut through the, the, you know, the thick of the jungle or of the trees. A river in the desert. What are these things? Well, they're life. <laughs> if you're in the forest on foot and there's no road, you're doomed. You're walking in circles. Which studies have shown result from the difference in the length of your legs? Your leg, everybody's legs are slightly different length, like a half inch, but it's enough 
to make a circle. <laughs> it's crazy. You think you're walking straight, but you're not. Anyway, the road in the wilderness, the road or the path through the forest is your salvation. You can get out now. <laughs> the river in the desert is your salvation in a place where you otherwise would die and fast without water, without cooling. Right? Wild beasts will honor me, says the Lord, jackals and ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert to give drink to my chosen people the people whom I formed for myself, that they might declare my praise. Who are the wild animals, the jackals, the ostriches? Well, that's us. All of us who walked in our own ways in this world, in our own whatever it was, before we became sheep in the fold of God, we were wild animals, walking according to whatever traditions are out there, doing our own thing. But the river flows through the desert and that water draws you. He said, it flows to give drink to my chosen people. He knows those who are his. He knows what will happen when the truth goes forth, that there are people who want the truth. There are people who are looking for God. And when his word goes out, it will succeed in making him known. And it will succeed in, in attracting those who are thirsty. Those whom I form for myself, that they might declare my praise, he said. And that's back to the original idea. Every person who obeys the gospel is a new creature created in Christ Jesus. It's a new start, a new beginning, a new thing that's being done. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 4, where we are. So I ask you to think about these things. You know, you could be discouraged by looking around you and seeing what's happening in uh, whatever, lots of different ways. There are many and plenty of discouraging things in the world, including some discouraging things in the situations that we find ourselves in as the children of God. But I would encourage you to Stop looking around and start looking up. Remember that God is the one who is doing it. And so we go to 2 Corinthians 4 to talk about your role in this. It says that the apostles having this ministry by mercy of God do not lose heart. They said, we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the statement, the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God, because what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. You know, that's worth thinking about for you and me. Oops. That in verse 1, they do not lose heart. And that though they have they face setbacks and though they face challenges, he said, we refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. We have renounced underhanded ways. Meaning they will not compromise the scriptures in order to gain the favor of men. And neither must we. That fifth verse said, what we proclaim is not ourselves. That's also good because we don't have the power. God has the power. We proclaim Jesus as Lord, ourselves as servants. The God, verse 6, who said, let light shine out of darkness. That's Genesis when he created the world. Has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The same God who spoke light into existence has shown in our hearts the light of the knowledge of God through Jesus. But we have this treasure in jars made out of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God, not to us. We are the jars made out of clay. 
We are the, you know, not that strong, not that stable. Maybe perhaps not where you would be looking. If somebody came into a property and was looking for the valuable things, they probably wouldn't be looking at the terracotta, the earthenware vessels. They're looking for a safe or something like this. But we are the earthenware vessels and we are also the repository of this treasure that is the light of the glory of God in our souls. And he said there's a reason for it. <laughs> it's not just thorns and thistles, although we got those too. It is to show that the surpassing power belongs to God, not to us. The power to overcome, the power to surpass, is not ours, it's God's. We do overcome in God, but not for our own power, through Him, through His Word. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, yeah, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Yet, we have to pay something for it. It's valuable, it's worthwhile. But, as he said, you know, forsaken, or uh, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, not destroyed, afflicted, yeah, in every way, but still not crushed. We're still here. Perplexed, but not despairing. Yeah, I mean, that's that sounds right to me. That's about how this goes. <laughs> there's setbacks, there's trouble, there's difficulty. Um, that's the way that this is. And yet, we're still here. And I think, too, that that's probably the most... Um, that's probably the most difficult aspect of this for Satan and those that serve him is that, well, we're still here. And, um, you know, from his way of thinking, that shouldn't be the case. We should have given up. We should have thrown in the towel a long time ago by his way of looking at this. And yet, we're still here. I think, I think that's bothersome to him. Um, I think that people expected that this would fold, that uh, we would give up or give up hope. Um, but no, I'm not. I'm not doing that. And uh, you know, I want to encourage you not to do that either. And it's not because uh, I'm so great or you're so great, although you are great. Um, it's because God is great and we serve him and we are insisting uh, on cutting no corners, taking no shortcuts, accepting nothing less but the word of God. And that's where the power is and that's where the life is. And we live these wonderful lives where we know that God is with us and that God hears us and that this is our father's world. So we have this in... Well, earthen vessels. <laughs> Let it be clear that the power is not ours, it's God's. And let's rejoice and give him thanks and give him honor and praise as is appropriate for that. That's our place in this world, in this universe. Today, are you a Christian? Become a Christian to obey God, to glorify God, to live as you ought in this life while you have time. We'll help you to obey the gospel. We'll, we'll bring you, uh, you know, based on your repentance, we'll, we'll come to water that you might be baptized in the name of Jesus, putting to death the old person so that the new person can be resurrected, as we read in the prophets. That you might have rivers of life flowing, the Spirit of God in you by means of his word. Today, are you a Christian who hasn't lived right? Well, let us pray that you may be restored to God, that you may have forgiveness from him. None of us is above temptation or falling. We need each other. We'll pray for one another. There isn't much else out there, but I am for you and I want to help you. And I believe that you feel the same way for me because we are the children of God together. 
we are his people. And he hasn't tasked us with something that we cannot do. But we do need to rise to the occasion and, and get it done. Today, are you in need of our prayers? Or are you in need of obeying the gospel? Let your spiritual need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected. <laughs>